Every time Greta takes the subway, she puts $100,000 in her bag and deliberately pretends to accidentally leave it on the seat. When a young girl passing by picks up the bag and walks away, she leaves the subway station feeling satisfied. The girl has found a designer bag left in the same spot for two consecutive days. She looks around and sees no one around who seems to be the owner of the item. Tempted by the huge opportunity, the girl picks up the handbag and casually walks out of the subway station. Little does she know that this greedy act will bring catastrophic disaster upon her. Back at home, the girl, Frances, tells her friend Erica about finding the designer bag on the subway. Besides the $100,000 cash, there was also an ID card inside. Erica suggests they should return everything intact to the owner at the address listed on the ID, believing that the owner must be anxiously searching for the bag by now. Following Erica's advice, Frances heads to a remote apartment early the next morning as per the address on the ID. Upon opening the door, Greta is surprised to see Frances holding the designer bag. She feigns ignorance and showers Frances with gratitude, then invites her in for a cup of coffee. Frances, trusting Greta's intentions, enters the apartment without suspicion. However, shortly after sitting down, she hears urgent knocking sounds coming from behind the living room wall, as if someone is hidden inside. Greta explained to Frances that the noise was just the neighbor next door doing renovations, something she had grown accustomed to. At that moment, Frances noticed the wedding photos on the side, and inquired about the absence of Greta's husband. Greta revealed that her husband and daughter had passed away 18 years ago, and she had been living alone ever since. Realizing her mistake, Frances quickly apologized for bringing up such a painful topic. Greta remained silent, walking over to the piano and starting to play a tune from the sheet music. The melodious sound filled Frances' ears, completely unaware that the seemingly kind-hearted Greta was actually a deranged killer. While she appeared to be playing music, Greta was actually masking the knocking sounds from behind the wall. After spending some time together, Frances and Greta exchanged contact information, agreeing to meet again the next day. Back home in the evening, Frances shared her conversation with Greta during the day with Erica. She thought Erica would be happy for her, but Erica warned Frances to be cautious around Greta, suggesting that she had some ulterior motive. Frances brushed off Erica's concerns, thinking she was just jealous. Little did she know, at that very moment, Greta was flipping through Frances' social media profiles, confirming Erica's suspicions. There was something about Frances that piqued Greta's interest. The next day, Frances went to Greta's house for their planned dinner. As they set the table, Frances noticed two candles missing. Greta pointed to a cabinet in the corner, saying there were extras inside and asked Frances to fetch a few. She crouched down to open the cabinet door, only to be stunned by what she saw. Inside were dozens of designer handbags, identical to the ones she found on the subway. Curious, Frances randomly picked one and opened it, to her surprise, finding $100,000 cash and a driver's license inside, just like before. What made it even more bizarre was that each handbag had a yellow note stuck to the back, with a girl's name written on it. Half in disbelief, Frances picked up another one, and to her shock, her own name was on it. At that moment, Frances was completely bewildered. She realized that Greta had been orchestrating this all along, deliberately setting her up. Instead of panicking, Frances played it cool, pretending she hadn't noticed anything unusual. She joined Greta in the living room and had dinner as if nothing had happened. After a few rounds of drinks, Greta noticed Frances was a bit tipsy and hinted that she could stay the night. Frances quickly declined, hastily putting on her clothes and leaving the apartment in a hurry. From then on, no matter how many times Greta called, Frances pretended not to see. She thought that would be the end of it, but little did she know that Greta had latched onto her like glue. Greta sent threatening texts, saying that if Frances didn't respond, she would come knocking on her door. After being stopped by the front of house manager in the kitchen, Frances had no choice but to face Greta head on. She told Greta that she had discovered the secret in the cabinet and wanted nothing more to do with her. After giving Greta a piece of her mind, Frances walked away without looking back, leaving Greta standing alone. Since then, Greta hadn't harassed Frances directly, but instead, she stood outside, staring at her from morning till night, unmoving. Frances was so frightened that she called the police, but they said that Greta's behavior didn't constitute a crime and they couldn't intervene. The officer advised Frances not to dwell on it. They believed that Greta might just be trying to get her attention. The more frightened Frances became, the more relentless Greta seemed to be. After the officer finished speaking, Greta indeed vanished from the street outside. Frances, feeling relieved, absent-mindedly returned to her building. However, as she stepped out of the elevator, Greta appeared behind her, 
startling Francis. She threatened Greta, saying that if she dared to stalk her again, she would call the police and have her thrown in jail. But Greta wasn't intimidated. Instead, she said she would stick to her like gum on a shoe. Before leaving, Greta spat out some gum that got stuck in Francis's hair. With substantial evidence of harassment, she and Erica went to the police station to file a report. But when the female officer learned it was just a piece of gum, she deliberately made things difficult for Francis, saying that such a trivial matter required following legal procedures. They would need to fill out an application form for the court, pay the fee, and then wait for the judge's decision. They couldn't guarantee how long it would take. Disappointed, the two left the station. Back at home, Francis received a strange text message on her phone, containing photos taken secretly by Erica. It seemed that Greta was trying to use Erica to threaten her. Realizing the danger, Francis quickly called Erica, telling her that Greta was following her and urging her to run. But no matter where Erica ran, Greta always managed to take photos and send them to Francis. At a crossroads, Erica couldn't take it anymore and decided to teach Greta a lesson. This almost led to a collision with a passing driver, but Francis arrived just in time. She pulled Erica into the car, and the two of them managed to shake off Greta for good. The next day, while Francis was having tea, she received an unexpected phone call from a stranger claiming to know some secrets about Greta. They agreed to meet at a nearby coffee shop. Upon meeting, the person introduced themselves as Nancy, who used to be Greta's psychiatrist. Nancy had developed a mental illness after her husband and daughter died and had a strong controlling tendency towards everyone. She advised Francis that the only way to break free from Greta's control was to confront her directly, have an open conversation, and make Greta willingly let go. Avoiding her indefinitely wasn't a solution. That evening, while Francis was working at the restaurant, Greta showed up and specifically ordered food from Francis. Despite trying to restrain her inner fear as much as possible, Francis still felt uneasy facing Greta in person. Right in front of Francis, Greta smashed the wine glass in her hand, demanding Francis to obey her like a servant. In the midst of the dispute, Greta flipped the table, advancing towards Francis step by step. At that moment, she seemed no different from a lunatic, and everyone looked at them with strange eyes. With no other choice left, the restaurant had to call the police to restrain Greta and take her away in a police car. Before leaving, Francis complained to the officer from yesterday, more, right? realizing that ignoring the crazy Greta didn't work at all. The next day, Francis received a call back from the police, informing her that since Greta hadn't caused any harm to her, they had to release her without charges. This meant that Greta was back to being a thorn in Francis's side. Feeling hopeless, Francis sat on the ground, unsure of what to do next. At that moment, Erica came up with an idea. She suggested pretending to reconcile with Greta, then deceiving her by claiming that she needed to go away for a while. If they avoided contact for an extended period, maybe Greta would forget about her. It seemed like the only option left, so they had to try it out. Francis went to a nearby church, where she found Greta and apologized for her previous disrespect, hoping for forgiveness and reconciliation. Greta forgave Francis, just as expected. Soon after, Francis told Greta that she needed to go away for a while, but promised to meet her as soon as she returned. The two embraced each other with reluctance. However, Francis didn't actually leave for a business trip. Instead, she hid in her apartment to lay low. Meanwhile, Greta, growing impatient after days of waiting without seeing Francis, realized she had been deceived once again. Losing all patience, she discreetly slipped a few drops of a potion into a glass of milk and stealthily entered Francis's apartment. Unaware, Francis drank the milk in one gulp. When the potion took effect, Greta emerged from the shadows. At that moment, Francis was powerless to resist or even speak. She could only watch as Greta escorted her into a taxi, taking her away. Not long after, the two arrived at a remote apartment. Greta dragged the unconscious Francis into a small room and locked her up. She then used Francis's fingerprint to unlock her phone. To avoid suspicion from Erica and her family, Greta impersonated Francis and sent them a text message about going on a vacation, ensuring no one would suspect foul play. Before long, Francis regained consciousness from her slumber. She found all the doors and windows around her firmly sealed with steel bars. Standing by the door, she pounded on the walls incessantly, hoping to attract the attention of her neighbors. However, Greta's piano playing outside drowned out the sound of her pounding. No matter what Francis did, it seemed futile. A week later, Francis's father arrived at the apartment as planned to celebrate his daughter's birthday, but to his surprise, only Erica opened the door. Both of them were instantly alarmed. As it turned out, 
The text message Greta sent to Francis's father claimed she was going on vacation with Erica, while the one sent to Erica stated she was going on a trip with Francis's father. They had both been deceived. Realizing the situation was dire, Francis's father quickly called the police. With the clues provided by Erica, the authorities swiftly identified the lone culprit as Greta, who lived alone. Armed with the address from the records, the officer made their way to the door. Meanwhile, Francis was bound hand and foot, imprisoned on the bed. She heard Greta and the police officer talking outside. It was a perfect opportunity to call for help. Francis struggled incessantly, making noise in an attempt to attract their attention. In no time, the officer indeed discovered a hidden door behind the piano. Just as they were about to open it, Greta suddenly grabbed a syringe from behind and jabbed it into the neck of the officer. The next moment, the officer staggered and collapsed to the ground. He reached for his gun, aiming it at Greta, but due to his impaired motor skills, he missed his shots despite firing twice. When the officer lost consciousness completely, the crazed Greta picked up the fallen gun and fatally shot the officer, sealing all the bullet holes in the wall. Greta embarked on her next target, following the same modus operandi as before. She intentionally left the bag on a subway seat when nobody was looking, waiting for her prey to take the bait. As expected, the next day, the girl found her way to the address on the ID and knocked on the door. Using the same excuse as before, Francis's attempts to make noise against the wall were masked by Greta's explanation of renovation noise from next door. Just then, the girl seized the opportunity to secretly drop a drop of liquid into Greta's coffee. Unaware, Greta drank it down, only to lose control of her body and collapse to the ground moments later. With Greta incapacitated, the girl removed her disguise, revealing herself to be Francis's friend Erica all along. Following the sound of knocking, they found the hidden door behind the piano, rescued Francis, and swiftly prepared to leave the apartment. Suddenly, the sound of a piano echoes from outside. Erica tells Francis to stay hidden inside while she grabs a weapon and rushes out. Meanwhile, Greta vanishes from the living room, her whereabouts unknown. With caution, Francis steps out from the secret room. Suddenly, Greta grabs her by the neck and forcefully pins her against a bookshelf. Soon after, the drugs in Greta's system take effect, causing her to lapse into unconsciousness. Francis and Erica choose not to seek revenge, but instead lock her in a box, equipped with toys, before alerting the authorities and leaving the scene. Greta's remaining years will be spent behind bars. And with that, the story concludes, serving as a cautionary tale against greed and deception.